Excellent. And uh, okay, so thank you very much. And uh, so thank you very much, everybody, for being here. It is a great pleasure to start off this workshop with Mina Ganagic, who will talk to us about not categorification from mirror symmetry. So, Mina. Please. Okay, so, uh, well, I want to start by, well, of course, thanking you for uh, inviting me. It's, um, it's a great pleasure to be in Japan, even uh, virtually. Um, I also want to apologize that I actually won't be able to stay with you for the rest of the conference today because <laughs> due to COVID, my parents are visiting for the first time in a, a year and a half and they are like landing in San Francisco right now. So, <laughs> so I'm afraid I'll, I'll, um, I'll have to decouple after my talk, but hopefully I'll understand. It's one of the many bizarre things of COVID. So anyway, but as, as, as you said, um, there's some great things which is we get to be um, uh, together virtually. All right, so um, this is a um, um, uh, talk about uh, two papers, one of which appeared uh, last April and the other one which um, appeared just recently. Oh, and my mouse forgot again, here we go. So uh, in 98, Kavanaugh showed that there is a, a deeper structure underlying uh, link invariant uh, discovered by Jones in 85. Jones associated to a link a polynomial in one variable such that links with different polynomials cannot be smoothly deformed into each other. Uh, the coefficients of his polynomial is always integer. Um, I should say also, there won't be much number theory in this talk, <laughs> but um, what there will be is um, essentially this work arose from earlier work uh, with Andre Okunkov and uh, Edward Frankel um, connecting string theory uh, in a new way to some generalization of Langland. So, <laughs> okay, that's my excuse for talking about this. All right. So anyhow, the coefficients of this polynomial always integer. What Colin have explained is that one can recover uh, the Jones polynomial as a um, shadow of a cohomology theory, which is associates to link a collection of vector spaces that are graded by a fermion number and, and a covariant grade, a grading, second grading, which we'll call a covariant. Um, the vector spaces are themselves link invariant and their Euler characteristic, the graded um, a covariant Euler characteristic is um, the Jones polynomial. Uh, in 88, Edward Witten explained that the Jones polynomial comes from Jim Simon's theory with gauge group um, based on Lie algebra S2 with um, effective to Simon's level, um, um, which is related to the variable Q of Jones's polynomial. Uh, he showed that uh, the Jones polynomial is the expectation value of a collection of Wilson loops in the fundamental representation of SU2 supported along the link components in Trans Simon's theory on R3. This immediately led to a generalization of uh, Jones's polynomial by varying the Lie algebra and the representations. The resulting um, invariants are known as uh, quantum group invariants. The relation of witness link invariants to uh, quantum groups was developed um, a year later uh, by Rishitikin and Turai. What I'll explain um, is that uh, Kavanaugh's construction also has an origin in physics and one that generalizes to all gauge groups in parallel to what Witten did in 88. From string theory, uh, one discovers in fact two approaches related by version of two-dimensional mirror symmetry. And um, the resulting theory turns out to be solvable explicitly. Um, the reason we end up with two-dimensional physics is because the descriptions we will get come from two-dimensional theories associated to a uh, link times uh, time in R3 times time. In fact, the way the construction comes out of string theory, um, the theory is naturally uh, equipped to describe not just links in R3, uh, but, or R3, but also links in R2 times S1. So um, it solves a more general problem for free. Um, why am I? Okay. Uh, occasionally, my mouse falls asleep. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the, the two-dimensional theories come out of defects of the six-dimensional zero-two conformal field theory, as was anticipated um, in the works of Oguri and Bafa in uh, 99 and uh, Gukov, Schwartz and Bafa in 2004. 
the implication of their works was that if one is able to understand how to extract spaces of BPS states from the two zero theory with defects, um, they will be common homology groups and their generalizations. Um, there is a five and or six dimensional approach to the problem that's being developed um, by Witten. The, the approaches that I'll describe are complementary um, in that they solve the problem from perspective of two dimensional theories on defects themselves rather than from six dimensions or five dimensions. Now, the fact that uh, this problem is tractable at all, um, let alone solvable explicitly, is very surprising. Um, in fact, uh, in the case of the dose polynomial and its categorification, we'll discover a new formulation of covenant homology, which is in the computational complexity sense more efficient than the original. So not only does it generalize, but it's actually more efficient. I don't know why it does this. Okay. Uh, the reason um, Chinsan is not invariance interesting from my perspective is not so much that we care about knots on the invariance, uh, or I care about knots and the invariance, but rather um, because of the wealth of mathematics and physics connections that one gets to discover uh, once you understand. Uh, the fact that the structure arises uh, from a deeper theory will no doubt uh, lead to many more connections. Uh, we'll see one of them here um, to solvable but highly non-trivial examples of homological mirror symmetry, which um, connected to representation theory. Um, in the same 89 paper, uh, Witten showed that underlying Transimus theory is a two-dimensional conformal field theory um, associated to G and, um, and um, Kappa or Q. Um, which is um, the WZW model uh, with affine uh, Lie algebra symmetry. This will be our starting point. The Hilbert space of Transimus theory uh, is a space of conformal blocks of the affine Lie algebra on the Riemann surface, um, where uh, Wilson lines puncturing the Riemann surface translate into insertions of vertex operators. By varying positions of vertex operators as a function of Transimus time, um, you, we get a colored braid in the Riemann surface times time. The path interval on the Riemann surface times time interval um, computes a matrix that takes the Hilbert space and the space of conformal blocks from one time slice to another uh, along a specific path um, in parameter space corresponding to the braid. Now, any link invariant uh, can be represented as a, um, as a matrix element of the um, of such a braiding matrix between conformal blocks that correspond to the top and the bottom of this picture. That correspond to cups and caps. Now, the state, so um, such a conformal block is a state in Chosimus Hilbert space, and a specific state that describes this caps and presence of these caps and cups obtained by integrating the path integral on a mantle with the boundary of the Riemann surface with these insertions of Wilson lines corresponds to a conformal block where uh, pairs of vertex operators colored by complex conjugate representations come together and fuse to disappear. So in this way, both braiding and fusion play an important role in the story. Now, braiding and fusion matrices um, are known explicitly. Uh, the way to find them um, is to think about conformal blocks as a solution to a differential equation. The equation um, is the one that's discovered, that was discovered by Keynesian Kinesiological in the early days um, of uh, WZW models, um, where, um, with this, and the equation is with respect to positions of vertex operators on, on the Riemann surface. From perspective of the Keynesian Kinesiological equation, the braiding matrix is the monodrum matrix that um, along a path in parameter space described by the braid. The monodromy problem, for monodromy problems of this kind in general are very difficult. For the Keynesian zymological equation, it was solved by Dringfeld and by Kazan and Lustig, following words of, of works of uh, Tsuchiya and Kanye, Kanye and Kono in 88, some special cases, I see too. Now, uh, they, show that they showed that monodromy uh, matrix that reorders a neighboring pair of vertex operators 
um, uh, is in fact the R matrix of a quantum group associated to G, whose construction is canonical. And from the, uh, the R matrices, you can also recover the Braden matrices. So you, the, the problem becomes completely solvable. Um, now, our starting point um, for categorification is um, um, a realization of conformal blocks, um, and which comes from quantum field theory in two dimensions with n equals to two supersymmetry, which ultimately comes from string theory. Um, the string theory origin is really important because um, uh, the way um, one discovers it is as follows. It turns out that um, the Casey equation and conformal blocks of the uh, finally algebra um, have a, a striking and much more rigid uh, generalization whose existence is explained by string theory. In some sense, conformal invariance is universal, which this universality makes it also hard to pinpoint the exact physical origin of the theory. Um, but this more rigid generalization is so rigid that its origin is unique. Um, the deformation, uh, which will which string theory first makes contact with, is the one discovered uh, in the 80s by Igor Frankel and Nikolai Rashitikin. They show that one can break conformal invariance while preserving much of the structure that conformal field theory provides. And the fact that such a construction is possible is absolutely striking. Um, so we'll take the Riemann surface where conformal blocks live to be a punctured infinite cylinder rather than a plane. Because we'll be breaking conformal invariance, thus working on a cylinder and a plane are no longer equivalent. Uh, the deformation uh, that they discovered is based on uh, replacing the affinely algebra by what's called the quantum affine algebra, uh, which is a one parameter deformation of it. This ends up replacing the KZ equation by uh, the quantum KZ, or the QKZ equation, the quantum condition epistemological equation, which is a difference equation. You recover um, the KZ equation from the QKZ equation in a limit where um, the step P of the difference equation goes to zero uh, and, uh, sorry, goes to one. The, the parameter of deformation H bar goes to one, keeping um, the level kappa fixed. And moreover, the limit also keeps positions of the vertex operators fixed. Like in a conformal case, uh, solutions of the QKZ equation can be obtained as correlators of chiral vertex operators, except that everything inside is cutiform. We'll call solutions of this QKZ equation Q conformal blocks to remind us that something's deformed. Um, now, these turn out to originate from two zero little string theory in six dimensions, labeled by um, a simply list Lie algebra G, which one gets in a limit of type 2B string theory on an AD surface singularity. So of the same um, type as G. So from now on, um, we'll take G and LG to be the same and the Lie algebra to be simply laced. Um, there is a generalization to non simply list Lie algebras, but it's, 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 it is more evolved and um, we won't have time to, for it today. So, what one wants to do is study a six dimensional two zero little string theory on a six manifold, which is a product of the Riemann surface where conformal blocks live and four extra directions. Okay. Um, uh, the vertex operators on the Riemann surface will come from a collection of defects in little string theory, which are inherited from D brains of 10 dimensional string. So um, the D brains that one needs are D3 brains of type to B string theory. So little string theory comes out in the limit of type to B string on an AD surface singularity. And we'll need D, uh, D brains, which come from D3 brains on um, two cycles of the AD space. Uh, these D3 brains become two-dimensional defects of the six-dimensional little string theory on the remaining six directions. Uh, so we'll call the space where they're supported D. And then there's an extra complex plane. Okay. <clears throat> now, the theory on the D brains is a quiver gauge theory. Um, that um, was the, 
discovered by Douglas and Moore in 96, explaining Nakajima's work to physicists. So it's a textbook string theory. Um, the theory is a three-dimensional, even though d uh, supported a two-dimensional um, um, uh, space D in six dimensions, the theory on them is actually a three-dimensional quiver gauge theory on D times S1 uh, because of string winding. Uh, little string theory being string theory, um, the string winding modes um, going from one d brain uh, back to itself around the circle. Now, one of the results of my prior work with Andrea Kukov um, is that one can get uh, the fundamental solution of the QQZ equation, um, uh, the, the set of solutions, therefore, that span um, the space of conformal blocks from either the Coulomb branch or the Higgs branch of this three dimensional um, gauge theory. The Q conformal blocks turn out to be supersymmetric partition functions of the, of the quiver gauge theory. Um, on uh, D times S1, where um, as, was, as I'm drawing it here, think of D as a long cigar. And um, in computing the, in formulating the partition function, the P, the step of the difference equation and the H bar parameter of the quantum affine algebra, um, keep track of um, the holonomies of various R symmetries and the spin rotation around the this. The ranks of the vector spaces, which quiver gauge theory should we study, uh, um, deter is determined by um, the representation and a weight in that representation of the, um, which conformal blocks transform it. You can think of it as a representation simply of G or LG. Um, the uh, positions of vertex operators are positions of heavy flavored D3 brains on the Riemann surface. Um, the highest weight vector of the Vermont module um, that, send, that, um, that remember we're on a cylinder and there are two special insertions, one at the one end and the other one at the other end of the cylinder. So uh, it turns out one is related to the other by which what lambda is related to lambda prime by, um, um, by choice of which weight space you're working in. Uh, but anyhow, uh, what's important is that uh, lambda is determined by the final Leopoldus parameters of the 3D theory. And from the 2 zero theory perspective, it comes from the complex scalar fields in 2, in two zero theory, which abelianize. So this means that the theory that gives rise to these Q conformal blocks lives in the broken phase of the 2 zero theory. That's important because it means that all the complicated bulk dynamics of the two zero theory is actually completely not important. Which solution of the QKZ equation, um, the partition function computes depends on a choice of, bound, of the boundary condition that it found. Now, um, the fact that one can, which is what uh, Andre and I showed, they can obtain the partition function from either the Higgs branch, X check, or X, the Coulomb branch, is a reflection of three-dimensional mirror symmetry, which exchanges them uh, together with suitable identification of parameters and boundary conditions. Now, if we pursue the story further, rather than um, discovering not invariants, we would discover integrable lattice models and, um, uh, and those of very general kind. Um, so that's the story um, associated with arbitrary uh, Lie algebra. And, um, so this is the story developed in the work with Andre. Um, what we want to do here is rather return to our main interest, which is to get a superstring um, or supersymmetric quantum field theory realization of conformal blocks of a finally algebra. So for this, we need to take um, we need to turn off the H bar deformation. It turns out that the limit that takes the quantum affine algebra to the affine Lie algebra is the very same limit that takes the little string theory of two zero type to two zero conformal field theory. The reason we broke conformal invariance is that little string theory has a scale. In the point particle limit, the winding modes that made uh, the defects three dimensional instead of two become infinitely heavy. So as a result, in the conformal limit, the theory on the defects is a two-dimensional theory on D. Now, it's surprising 
<laughs> um, but well understood that uh, there are two, uh, there are different two dimensional limits a three dimensional gauge theory can have. The point particle uh, limit of little string theory or the conformal limit of the quantum affine algebra specifies exactly which two dimensional limit one needs to take. The limit we need is not the one that takes a 3D gauge theory to a two dimensional gauge theory with the same Lagrangian. Rather, it's a limit that would do that for the 3D mirror theory. The resulting theory uh, describes two dimensional defects is the derivation of the theory on two dimensional defects of the zero two conformal field theory. Um, the mod, the, and, the result, and the theory is not a gauge theory in general. One description of the theory um, on the defects is a supersymmetric sigma model with a hypercalar target, which is the column, which um, came from the column branch of the 3D gauge, of the 3D gauge theory. Um, this column branch uh, the, um, can be described, um, well, in general, of course, construction of column branches, these kinds of theories, the work of uh, Nakajima and Brauerman and Filkeberg, for us, um, uh, uh, much of the, the okay, uh, it suffice to know that um, it can be thought of as the modular space of singular G monopoles with prescribed direct singularities on R3, um, where G here is um, a Lie group of adjoint type with the algebra G. The Coulomb branch is also. Um, 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 a, re a resolution of, of a certain tra transversal slice in a fine Grassmannian of G, um, where again here G is uh, um, the same um, uh, Lie group um, as the one for the monopoles. This comes about by thinking of uh, it's not the same as fine Grassmannian as the, in the uh, Brauerman Nakajima Nek Finkelberg. It's the uh, fine Grassmannian that you get by thinking of moduli space of monopoles as um, as obtained by a sequence of Hecke correspondences. Um, anyway, the supersymmetry is broken um, to n equals to two by rotations of the transverse complex plane. Um, that uh, the corresponding symmetry acts on the scalars and vector multiplets, and also scales the holomorphic symplectic form on the two zero form on the Coulomb brand. Uh, the, this is part of a larger symmetry, larger torus of symmetries acting on the Coulomb branch that include the phi Heliopolis parameters of the original 3D theory. So these phi Heliopolis parameters that, um, that acted as Raman modules um, and broke conformal, broke, um, um, uh, resulted in breaking of the, uh, taking the 200 under Coulomb branch, um, on its Coulomb branch. Um, from perspective of uh, the <laughs> of X, conformal blocks that partition functions of the supersymmetric sigma model on D, deformed by twisted masses associated with this large torus of symmetries one works with respect. Uh, one inherits in the interior of D, A type twist, and at infinity of this, um, one places the B type boundary condition. This infinite length of the cigar makes a type supersymmetry in the interior compatible with any supersymmetry on the boundary, even of B type. And we'll pick B. From perspective of uh, X, our column branch, um, of the 3D gauge theory on the defects, uh, um, the, what used to be 3D gauge theory, what used to be a 3D gauge theory before we took the conformal limit. So anyway, from perspective of X, the KZ equation is what's called a uh, quantum differential equation. It's an equation for flat sections of a connection on a vector bundle with fibers, the cohomology groups of X, over the complexified Kähler moduli. Um, this quantum differential equation was introduced by Gibbenthal in the early days of mirror symmetry. And um, the fact that two equations coincide, the quantum um, um, differential equation of X and the KZ equation is a recent theorem of um, Ivan Danilenko, who was a postdoc at Berkeley now. One gets different solutions uh, to the quantum differential equation and then um, different solutions to the Knizhny semiological equation by choosing different B type frames as boundary conditions at infinity. 
These boundary conditions, they form a category and category of boundary conditions of the sigma model on X preserving B type supersymmetry and working equivalently with respect to T is known as the derived category of T equivalent coherence sheaves, as was explained by in works of Douglas, Aspinwall, um, Hori, and others. Um, since the KZ equation is this quantum differential equation, um, action of braiding on the space of conformal blocks is monogramming of the quantum differential equation along a path in the KLM moduli corresponding to the braid. This braid group acts on the corresponding category of brains on the boundary conditions um, by auto equivalences of the derived category because along the path in KLM moduli, the category of B-type brains stays the same while individual brains transform. It follows then uh, that the path integral of the sigma model on the annulus, uh, where time runs along the annulus, computes the matrix element of the monodromy matrix between a pair of conformal blocks corresponding to a pair of B type brains at the boundary. The same path integral with time running uh, around the circle, around the annulus, um, on the circle of the annulus instead, computes the index of the supercharge preserved by the two brains. The, the cohomology of that supercharge is the space of supersymmetric ground states. Um, it's computed by the derived category as its most basic ingredient, the space of morphisms between a pair of brains. So, so far we understood that the derived category of, of or the category of B brains uh, manifestly categorifies braiding matrix elements between pairs of conformal blocks. The quantum link invariant should also be categorified by this, uh, you know, by the same category of B brains because um, link invariants, as we saw, are matrix elements of the braiding matrix between pairs of conformal blocks. Now, for this, you need to uh, find objects of the derived category whose vertex functions are conformal blocks in which pairs of vertex operators fuse the trivial representation lead to these caps or caps. Now, with uh, help of mirror symmetry, I show that um, along with braiding, fusion has a geometric interpretation in terms of uh, certain perverse filtrations on the derived category of co coherent sheaves. These were envisioned by uh, Chuang and uh, Rokwe without many concrete examples of geometric origin. I think they had precisely one. Um, one learns from this, um, that brains, which lead to caps and cups, are not some abstract objects of the derived category, some abstract complexes of coherent shapes. They are actually <laughs> brains wrapping vanishing cycles. Um, they are structure shapes of vanishing cycles in X. Um, the cycles are shrink to point as, um, as pairs of vertex operators come together. So um, they're specifically, uh, the vanishing cycle, so if you have a collection of caps colored by minuscule representations, I don't know if I said, it's very important that the representations are minuscule. Anyway, uh, the, the corresponding caps are simply products of minuscule Grassmannians or structure sheaves of a product of minuscule Grassmannian that one can show X develops in that limit in Kaler modular. Um, now using the reason uh, uh, Rokwe and Chuang came up with these perverse filtrations is that they give an incredibly powerful way to think about um, 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 derived equivalences. Um, using very special properties of the resulting perverse filtrations and these vanishing cycle brains, it's not hard to show, um, even for a physicist, that uh, not only do uh, homology groups categorify link invariants, so it's not, it's not just that their other characteristic is a link invariant, they themselves are link invariants, which is what you want. Um, this, these perverse filtrations, which I discovered with the help of mirror symmetry, um, vastly simplifies um, the proof, for example, in the AN case, uh, due to commentary and cowardice, um, of that one gets link invariants um, from such, um, they have a slightly, slight version of this, slight modification of this construction. But anyway, what they use as uh, Fourier-Mokai transforms, this is far simpler. Um, 
it's far simpler than um okay uh it so the theory makes very, very special, very concrete predictions um, about a specific nature of the underlying reverse equivalences, which turns the proof that these homology groups actually are not invariants. Um, in a sense, it becomes true because it's true in conformal field theory. In a very non-trivial sense, you really need to know what these perverse filtrations are and how derived equivalences act on them. But one can, what, one can show what, what happens using mirror symmetry. So this is what I did in the first paper. Uh, recently, Ben Webster uh, proved that link invariants, they come from uh, um, category of B brains on the, on the Coulomb branch, which I formulated are equivalent to the invariants he derived in 2013 um, uh, using uh, KRL double algebra studied by Kovanov, Lauda, Ropi, and himself. And um, this improves on what he knew uh, in that he did not have a geometric understand, he didn't have any understanding of what motivates the caps and the caps. Okay. Now we actually know what they are. And it gives a much better way of describing what braiding functors do. All right, now, however, as stated, neither the approach by um, B-type brains on the Coulomb branch, um, nor these KRL double algebras is very computation friendly. So, uh, at least not the approach by KRL double algebras is known uh, in the literature uh, so far. So, uh, in the rest of the talk, I want to describe how physics lets one reformulate the problem and solve the theory. There, this resulting description is completely new. <clears throat> now, the conformal, remember, um, um, to get the QKZ equation and Q conformal blocks, we could do it either from the Coulomb branch or the Higgs branch. And then we took the limit of the Coulomb branch. It turns out the same limit of the, of the Higgs branch description is not good at all. The limit results in a terrible singular space because the limit turns off the Kähler variables. So any geometric description uh, related to the Higgs branch is gone. What one gets instead is a lambda Gisbrook model whose target is an open, turns out to be, an open subset of symmetric products of copies of the Riemann surface that's visible in type to B string, the Riemann surface where conformal blocks live, which is for us an infinite cylinder with a certain potential W. Now, um, the relation between the description on X, based on X and on Y is a cousin of ordinary two-dimensional mirror symmetry. Um, mirror symmetry that relates them um, can't be ordinary because y is half the dimension of the Coulomb branch. <clears throat> Instead, it turns out uh, that the Coulomb branch is um, a core, has a core locus. Now we have two axes. We'll call the Coulomb branch the big X and its core the small X because the core is half the dimension of the Coulomb branch. So the core is half dimensional and contains all the information about the geometry of the big X. So small X knows all about the big X, even though it's half the dimension. And Y is really a mirror of the small X of the core. Okay. Uh, sorry, yeah. So uh, the core is the locus preserved by this action that's, by the C star action that's responsible for the theory knowing about Q of not invariance. On um, the core, all the complex scalars and vector multiples become massive as long as Q is not equal to one. And consequently, it gets set to zero. Now, on general grounds, <laughs> more precisely, uh, not so general, by the paper that uh, Corey, David Tong, Andreas Karch, and I wrote long ago, <laughs> um, by, the, so by the origin of 3D gauge, in the 3D gauge theory, x, small x and y are related by t-duality or mirror symmetry. Um, because the small x and the small y have as much information about the geometry as the big x and its mirror, big y, we'll call the small y the equivariant mirror of the big x 
there are lots of things that people mean by covariant neuro symmetry. We all mean something very new and different from us. So, so it's the, the relation going diagonally. It changes the dimension. Now, um, the small, small x embeds into the big x as a holomorphic Lagrangian. It's half dimensional. While uh, the ordinary mirror, big Y of the big X, fibers over uh, of a small Y with um, homomorphic Lagrangian C star to the corresponding power fibers. All right, now, um, um, a model example to keep in mind is uh, big X, which is, uh, uh, AM minus res resolution of an AM minus one singularity, okay, uh, which arises the Coulomb branch of a quiver gauge theory with a quiver with one node, uh, U, U1 gauge theory, and M hypermultiples. So the core, so big X is the AM minus one surface. The core looks like um, a collection of M minus one P1s with a pair of infinite disks attached. So it's non-compact. Um, the ordinary mirror of the big X is um, big Y, which is what's called a multiplicative A minus one surface with a potential, which we won't need. It's known what it is, but we won't need it. Um, this multiplicative A minus one surface is a C star vibration. So we are in this example where um, the small Y is one dimensional, big X is, um, too complex dimensional. So uh, multiplicative uh, A and minus one surface is a C star vibration of a Y, where Y here looks like an infinite cylinder with uh, M mark points in the interior. And at the mark points, the C star fibers degenerate. So uh, there are M minus one Lagrangian spheres in the big Y, mirrored to M minus one P1s, vanishing P1s in the big X. These n minus one um, Lagrangian spheres in the big Y projects to La Lagrangians in the small Y, which is begin and end at the punctures. So they're just straight line Lagrangians. Um, the uh, small Y in this case is a single copy of the Riemann surface where conformal blocks live. The positions of, uh, remember uh, the limit we took preserves the, all the data of the geometry of the Riemann surface, positions of vertex operators, all that. So positions of vertex operators correspond to um, mark points where the C star vibration of the big Y of the small degenerates. Now, um, by SYZ mirror symmetry, uh, the small X and the small Y, so they look like this, they share a common base, which is an infinite line with some marked points. Um, the marked points um, are projection of places where the S1 in the small x degenerates and positions of um, uh, where the punctures are on the small y. Uh, the fibers, this is the imprint of 3D mirror symmetry or um, a three-dimensional origin. The fibers um, are holonomies of the 3D gauge fields around the S1 the, the, the circle originates from the holonomy of the 3D gauge field that are under S1, single U1 gauge field in this case, and the dual photons in the case of X. And it's mirror symmetry because mirror symmetry relates dual photons to holonomies of the those lines. More generally, the equivariant mirror of the big X and the ordinary mirror of its core is Y, which is, um, it's, uh, obtained by taking symmetric products of the Riemann surface where conformal blocks live with punctures. Uh, you delete a certain set. And then uh, you still have to, uh, there's in, the space is, the resulting space is singular. So you need to blow up the singularities in a way that doesn't really affect anything, but um, anyway. So the potential W is a multi-valued holomorphic function on the, on, on small y where um, the, uh, part of it are, originates from integrating out. It's just a one loop calculation in three dimensions. What's W? It originates from integrating out charged matter in 3D um, and taking a limit. And these terms here um, come from phi to the terms. 
they are essentially unchanged by the, the two-dimensional. Um, the whole potential mirrors the T equivalent action on the big X. From a mirror perspective, um, conformal blocks um, are partition functions of B twisted theory on a very long cigar with A type uh, boundary condition infinite, a Lagrangian in Y. And mirror symmetry predicts that conformal blocks of the finally algebra are, um, uh, did I say, sorry? Yeah, okay. Uh, and then uh, partition function, so we always said this, the very same conformal blocks. Now, the point is, such amplitudes have the following form um, as uh, integral of the topomorphic form on y and each demands w and some insertions of chiral link operators. Um, these conformal blocks of the affine Lie algebra are generalizations of the pi stability central charge, charges of rings. Um, the generalization is by insertion of uh, vertex operators and by working equivariantly, which generates the superpotential. What we've discovered uh, from mirror symmetry is the integral formulation of conformal blocks of the affine Lie algebra. They go back to works of Fagin and Frankel and Schachmann and Bart. Okay. In fact, uh, there's a reconstruction theory due to given tall and Telemann, which says that starting with a solution of quantum differential equation, one gets to reconstruct all genus topological string amplitudes of any semi-simple 2D field theory, any massive 2D theory. Um, and in fact, the B twisted lambda Gisbert model and the A twisted sigma model on the big X, uh, working equivalent with respect to T, are equivalent to all genes. In fact, so then ordinary topological mirror symmetry cannot tell the dimension. Um, corresponding, um, well, corresponding to a solution uh, to the KZ equation is an A brain uh, um, at the boundary of this long cigar infinity. This A brain is an object of the category of A brains, which is um, known as the derived Foucault cyber category of Y with potential W. Uh, the set one needs to delete from Y um, gives rise to a collection of one forms with integer periods. Remember, W is a multi valued function. So the, um, um, uh, DW gives rise to one forms with integer periods on, uh, on Y, which is responsible for equivariant gradings of both the brains and the homes between them. Now, mirror symmetry helps us understand exactly which questions we need to ask to recover homological knot invariance from small y. Actually, since small y is ordinary mirror of the small x, uh, we should begin by understanding how to recover homological invariance from the small x instead of the big x. Now, every small x knows everything about the geometry of the big x. And in particular, every B-type brain on the big x that's relevant for us comes from a B-type brain on the core on the small x via um, a push forward functor that interprets a brain downstairs on small x um, as a brain upstairs on the big x. The categories are different, but um, you can always do that. Uh, this functor has what's called an adjoint, which goes the other way. It takes a brain upstairs, any brain upstairs on the big X, and takes it to uh, a brain downstairs on small X. It works by tensoring with the structure sheet of the small X and restriction. The construction of both of these functors is standard. Um, the fact that they're adjoint is that they exist and that they're adjoint is what lets one relate computations upstairs to downstairs. Um, adjointness means that for any pair of brains on the big X that originate from brains on the small X, uh, the homes between them, the uh, morphisms between them computed upstairs and downstairs agree provided um, you uh, replace one of the downstairs brains by a brain obtained by starting downstairs, sending it up and pushing it back down. So there's this push up and down functor that you need. 
um, and by mirror symmetry for every pair of beta grains um, um, on the big X, which come from the small X, there's a pair of, there's a mirror pair of A brains on the small Y such that the homes on small Y agree with the big, the homes on the big X. Okay, but again, you need to know it's function and it's not identity. Um, so these functors uh, between, um, uh, you can think of them as functors between the, down, the category of brains downstairs and the small y and the category of A brains upstairs and the big y. And they, re they relate objects in the way that mirrors A brains in the way that mirrors what happens for the B brains. Okay. Now, recall our example um, of small y, which is a covariant mirror of the big X. Um, which was the, where the big X was the AN uh, surface. So mirror to I vanishing P1 in the small X is a Lagrangian, which is just a straight line Lagrangian, okay, on the Riemann surface, which is Y. Um, the function that goes up simply takes any Lagrangian downstairs and pairs it with a circle fiber over it. So this is how you get these pictures of a P1, of the or S2 upstairs. That's familiar. The fact that it goes the other way doesn't send a vanishing sphere back to this interval brains. Instead, computing it either from your symmetry or by its definition, because you can do everything on the A side, which is joint work with Vivek Shende and um, Michael McBreen. Um, you can find um, the fact that this can be done always. Um, uh, one finds uh, a figure eight Lagrangian. So the brain that you get by starting with an interval brain, sending it up and back down, is not an interval again, it's a figure eight. Um, the basic feature of these adjoint functors is that they end up preserving um, the, the space of morphisms between the brain or, um, or the space of supersymmetric ground states. And it's not difficult to see that this is the case, and this I'll come back just by looking at intersections between Lagrangian. Now, the example um, I just gave uh, is relevant for common homology because um, if you have a link that's obtained by closing a, a braid with two D strands, the corresponding X is a Coulomb branch of a uh, quiver gauge theory, A1 quiver gauge theory, uh, where uh, uh, instead of what we change is instead of the rank of the node being one, as was in our model example, now the rank of the node of the, of the gauge node is D. So we have a UD gauge theory, but still we have M hypermultiplets, except M is 2D. Now, <clears throat> the very same X, big X, uh, can be described, and this is very helpful, as an open subset of a default symmetric product of an a m minus one surface. Um, that's a theorem of uh, Manolescu. In fact, um, it's a Hilbert scheme of d points on the name on the a m minus one surface. Open subset of the Hilbert scheme of d points. Um, in the big X, the brains that you need um, to get a column of homology would be supported on a vanishing cycle, which is a product of d non-intersecting p ones. So if you want D cups, you get D non-intersecting P ones. Um, it's a quivariant mirror is an open subset uh, after this resolution of a symmetric product of D copies of uh, the Riemann surface where conformal blocks live. So we have, it's a configuration space of simply D unordered points on the Riemann surface with a specific potential, which is So by covariant mirror symmetry, the D cups are product of D non-intersecting figure eights, and the D cups are product of D interval Lagrangians. Now in the lambda gisberg description, in fact, um, both the Lagrangians and the action of braiding on them is geometric. So you can um, simply translate, um, there's a, simp uh, a projection of a link uh, to a surface into a pair of Lagrangians. To do that, um, you pick a projection, uh, you choose a bicoloring uh, by an equal number of segments of each of the two colors, such that 
Red, say, always under process the blue. <clears throat> um, uh, the mirror Lagrangians are then obtained by um, replacing the blue segments by simple intervals and the red segments by figure eights. And by mirror symmetry, the homological link invariant um, uh, should be the space of super, well, which is the space of, sorry, the space of supersymmetric ground states between those brains should be the homological link invariant. Um, in the A model, um, the, um, the, the space of supersymmetric ground states may be computed by floor theory, which is modeled by a uh, more theory approach to supersymmetric um, quantum mechanics. The space of perturbative supersymmetric ground states. Um, so this is just standard floor theory, uh, not the variant of floor theory that, um, that uh, um, the, not the description of it, that description of the A model that Gayato, um, um, Moore and Witten had, um, the, just the traditional A model. So the space of, of perturbative supersymmetric ground states is spanned by uh, the intersection points of the Lagrangians. And it's graded always by the Fermi number, and in our case also by these equivariant grades. Um, the action of the supercharge is generated by instant homes, and the cohomology of the resulting complex is the space of exact ground states and the space of morphism between the brain and um, the space of supersymmetric yeah, ground states. Yeah, uh, the exact ground states, as I said. So um, now, in the floor, the floor approach to the A model, um, the action of the supercharge is obtained by counting holomorphic disc, disc instantons that interpolate from one uh, intersection point of Lagrangian to another, of Fermi number one, and equivariant degree zero. The degree, equivariant degree has to be zero in order for uh, the disc to be in Y. Now, it turns out that uh, in general, uh, describing the A model, while completely concrete, is very different. In our case, there's a simplification. The simplification is that um, the theory is a close cousin of what's known as the Hagard floor theory. Um, we would get Hagard floor theory by replacing SU2, which gives us the Jones polynomial, by uh, GL1 slash 1, which gives us the Alexander polynomial instead. Um, the Hagard floor theory has a target which is a different open subset of symmetric product of D copies of the Riemann surface with a similar but different potential, or it can be formulated in this way. In fact, the fact that Hagar floor theory can be formulated in these terms as a result of joint work with Miroslav Rapchak and um, Topir and um, uh, Elisa uh, Lepage, the student, um, and Rapchak is a postdoc at work. Anyway, we could obtain the Hagar floor theory. Um, by starting with a type 2b string theory on a conical instead of on an A1 singular, A1 surface singular. And the differences between the two theories can be accounted for by thinking of Hegel floor theory as a th theory of fermions on the Riemann surface, while ours, the one that leads to SU2, is a theory of anions. Anyway, Lagrangians on Y are products of D one dimensional Lagrangians. So the simplification is that you can do everything from perspective of the Riemann surface instead of this high dimensional space Y, which is its symmetric product. So a Lagrangian on Y, which is symmetric product of D copies of the Riemann surface A, are simply products of D one dimensional Lagrangians on the Riemann surface. So for example, the intersection points between um, pairs of Lagrangians are D tuples of intersection points of one dimensional Lagrangians. Uh, moreover, a holomorphic maps, a holomorphic map from a disk to Y, which you need to count to um, such maps you need to understand, for example, to understand the action of the differential, uh, projects with non-negative multiplicities to domains on the Riemann surface with boundaries on the one-dimensional Lagrangian and vertices at the intersection point. So in particular, for example, the shaded domain. Uh, is a domain in, um, that so it corresponds to working in a sym symmetric product of two copies of the Riemann surface. And um, there is one green intersection point and one black one. So there are just two points, even though the disk apparently has four vertices. 
R. In, as in Hegel floor theory, here too, one can read off uh, from the domain, this, from, just from the topology of the domain, both the fermion number and the equivariant degree of the map to R. So for example, the fermion number or the Maslow index of the disk is simply uh, given by computing um, the, you, you know, it from, it, you, you read it off from the other character of the shaded domain and the number of acute and obtuse angles that you get at the vertices. So for example, this particular disk is Maslow index one, just reading out the formula. Um, anyway, um, and there's a similar formula for the equivariant rate. Um, the index for this of the supercharge Q of uh, the theory on the interval uh, simply counts as always um, in the intersection points of Lagrangians keeping track of gradients. Oops. Uh, so the fact that um, the Euler characteristic in this case actually does compute the Jones polynomial is uh, actually a theorem of Bigelow from the 90s. Bigelow discovered this, this uh, unusual formulation of um, Jones polynomial, um, which um, was virtuous. Um, okay, is, okay. Um, the, anyway, we'll come back to the virtue in a moment. Uh, so, what, the, what we understood here from equivariant mirror symmetry is the origin of Bigelow's peculiar construction. Now, um, what we've also done is we've implicitly rephrased um, the A model in terms of which normally counts maps of Riemann surfaces to Y in terms of actually counting a holomorphic curves in D times the Riemann surface. Um, okay, so this is known as what's called the cylindrical approach to floor theory. It's, it's far from trivial um, um, and it's ideally suited for the symmetric product. So anyway, just uh, in this example, which came from a right-handed half link, there are um, altogether eight intersection points and six domains that could in principle contribute to the differential just by their degrees. Um, the cohomology of the corresponding complex should be called on homology of the right-handed half link. Um, and the fact that the differential squares to zero comes from uh, uh, canceling broken maps, canceling in pairs. So each map is a shaded domain. And here, the two different ways to break up a bigger shaded domain of Maslow index two into two of Maslow index one, um, one plus one. Anyway, um, and uh, in this theory, uh, the dimensions of vector spaces in the underlying complexes um, spanned by an intersection point grow polynomially uh, with the number of crossings, as opposed to, if you are familiar with Kovanov's approach, um, his growth is always exponential in the in the um, in um, uh, the number of crossings. So the space you have to write down, um, whose uh, is 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 much smaller. Now, um, however, in Kovanov's approach, computing the differential. Is, it is a completely explicit formula for the action of the differential. In this um, cylindrical approach to floor theory, uh, it reduces the problem of counting holomorphic maps, which you need to compute the, what the differential actually does, to a well-defined problem, not in terms of counting holomorphic curves, maps to some high dimensional space, but to a well-defined problem in complex analysis, basically applications of Riemannian mapping theory, uh, one for each domain. Okay. Uh, even though it's well-defined and very simple, it's literally a complex a problem in complex analysis, um, it's still very hard. Now, the surprise is that this problem can be solved. Um, the solution comes from making homological mirror symmetry that relates to small x and small y completely manifest. Um, the homological mirror symmetry that relates the actual derived categories. Now, working with the derived Fokai-Seidel category as opposed to just Fokai-Seidel categories is actually simpler. For one, the derived category has far fewer objects um, because any deformation of brains that doesn't change the amplitudes is equivalence. So that's a huge group of equivalences. Okay. Uh, by contrast, in just Fokai-Seidel category, um, 
you only get Hamiltonian isotopies of the brains, which is much, much smaller. In particular, you can generate the entire derived category from a finite set of brains, which are symbols of the potential. Now, in fact, uh, for every critical point um, of the potential, one gets uh, two, uh, two symbols, a left and a right, which are respectively um, set of all initial conditions for either upwards or downward gradient flows of real part of W, on which imaginary part of W is constant. Um, the critical points here are variant of Bayes' equations, um, and they are isolated and non-degenerate and labeled by the weights um, in the weight space, the conformable ox transformer. Now, the set of symbols depend on a choice of chamber in the covariant parameter space. Uh, there's a choice of chamber, which is suggested by mirror symmetry, in which the left symbols are simply products of real line Lagrangian. So if you think mirror symmetry for a cylinder should be simple, even homological mirror symmetry for a simple cylinder should be simple, it's simple. And this is very much like that, okay. except our space is a symmetric product of cylinders. Um, and correspondingly, there's a simple set of brains, which are just products of real line Lagrangians running along the cylinder. These brains are mirrored to line bundles on X. Um, to formulate homes between such brains, you need to deform, like morphisms between such brains, you need to deform them, after which um, the intersection points become isolated. There are infinitely many of them. Um, they have to be because by mirror symmetry, the homes from any one of these uh, left symbols, these real line Lagrangians, are, are to the something Lagrangians, to itself, have to coincide with a space of holomorphic functions on X, which is infinite dimensional. <clears throat> um, these symbols um, generate an algebra, um, which is simply the space of morphisms from a direct sum of all the symbol arrays, one for each critical point of the potential. You get not just a vector space, but you get an algebra because um, the theory inherits a product from Floyd theory. Now, it turns out that all the algebra elements have cohomological degree zero. In particular, this means that the action of the differential is trivial. You don't get a differential graded algebra, you just get an ordinary associative algebra. This is the simplest possible case. Um, in fact, that's not an accident because it's a reflection of mirror symmetry, which maps these real line Lagrangians, these left symbols in the chamber we chose, to line bundles on X. Now, there are not many holomorphic discounts that one can actually evaluate explicitly. Uh, it turns out all the ones that contribute to the algebra products are computable because they come from products of triangles, uh, which are in, the, in turn essentially almost completely determined by the simplest version, D equal to one version of the theory. And in fact, this is very similar to how people solve Hager Floyd theory. Um, now, um, these symbols generate a derived category, and everything there is to know about the symbols is contained in this algebra A, this is ordinary social two algebra. So this means um, this translates into a derived equivalence of derived category of A brains, sorry, the category, the category of A brains with um, the derived category of A modules of this algebra. Now, to help you think of such an algebra, in fact, any such associated algebra, essentially any such associated uh, algebra can be always thought of as a path algebra of a quiver whose nodes correspond to the critical points of the potential and where paths from one node to the next encode uh, the morphisms between the brains. Now for us, these quivers will always have closed loops in, in contrast with simpler theories that come from single value potentials. As a consequence, um, the theory is much richer representation theory in the richer derived category. But um, again, this is very much analogous to examples of um, mirror symmetry um, and um, generation results that resulted from the works of 
Bondal, for sapiens, and was studied by Hori and Bach and Iqbal, and picked up by Seidel and so forth. Um, so these examples are the same family. So concretely, for Y, which is a covariant mirror of the A minus one surface, uh, the algebra you get is the path algebra of the familiar affine A and quiver with some unfamiliar relations. Okay. Um, and in fact, the path algebra, um, the studying path on this quiver captures uh, all the thimble intersection points and um, you know, relations be between them. So anyway, uh, this familiar, the more familiar quiver, you might want um, arises from studying B type rings on the big X, where one gets a similar derived equivalence of representations of the algebra or, um, or simply quiver representations, the two are the same, um, and, um, and derived category of coherent sheets. Uh, so the quiver is the same, the algebra relations are slightly different. Uh, that these are the familiar ones. And in fact, the reason um, um, is that imposing the less familiar relation associated with Y corresponds to restricting the big X, the A minus one surface to its core. Um, and the category of B brains on the core then becomes the category of uh, modules of the small algebra. And so we've made homological neurosymmetry manifest. All any brain, any A brain on Y is a quiver representation. <laughs> and so is the brain on X. And you have manifest homological mirror symmetry. Uh, <clears throat> and in fact, this is the model of how this is always understood in all these examples, in, for all of our G actually. Um, all right, so this algebra is computable, I'm over time. The algebra is computable explicitly. Um, as I said, uh, it has flavors of the algebras that appeared in works of Coven of Lauda Roque, which Webster generalized. Um, the algebra, however, the algebra and the description of link invariants you get from it is far simpler than what came, uh, what's known in the con context of KRL double algebra. In particular, because we have a geometric, we understand where they come from geometrically. Uh, it's not just an algebra. The algebra has a geometric mean. <laughs> so let me just, I'm over time. I'll just explain in a few slides how this actually helps you understand common homology. So the virtue, by virtue of this um, derived equivalence is that any brain um, has a, what's called a projective resolution as a complex, every term of which is a direct sum of thimble brains. Um, the maps encode um, a prescription for how to obtain um, any brain you want, any product of figure eights or anything you want, um, uh, by starting with a direct sum of symbols, actually with cohomological degree shifts and all of this, um, and um, uh, gluing the brains. Um, by deforming the differential um, away from the trivial one by turning on the maps. Okay, turning on the maps gives uh, corresponds to giving expectation values to tachyons at the intersections of the of symbols. So, for example, uh, in the case of Y, which was the very mirror of the A minus one surface, this figure eight brain, okay, has a resolution uh, which has only um, uh, three steps in terms of four symbols and you glue them explicitly to figure eight. Just gluing is, is um, um, uh, li literally taking connected sums. Anyway, the, re the, re the reason this is so powerful is that um, our derived category has a second description uh, in terms of the right symbols. Um, the right symbols um, are, um, so we actually get a pair of equivalences that all, every one of our categories catches two different descriptions as, uh, as modules of some algebra. All of the right symbols uh, are compact, dual to the left, and, um, 
And in particular, the algebra you get from them is related to the original one by Kozuldov, which is an algebraic way to understand this equivalence. And again, this works for all G. Um, now, the reason, the part of it that's important for us today is that among the, all the right simple brains um, are the brains that serve as caps. In other words, they're the simple modules of the original, of the algebra. Okay. The simplest possible representations, the one that's rank one for one of the nodes and zero for all the others, except you need to know which nodes to pick. The consequence is striking. It means that we have a purely classical description of not homology groups, which one can read off from the description of the brain, of the cap brain, um, as a balance of symbols without any further work. Um, namely, as for all the brains, the description of the cup brain as the balance of symbols is obtained by starting with the direct sum, deforming the differential away from the trivial one by taking connected sums and turning on tachyons. From that complex, you get for free, just by rewriting, uh, a complex of vector spaces. These are the vector spaces that underlie, um, that the formulation of covenant homology starts with in his case, except for him, the vector spaces are very, very large. Anyway, uh, so you get a complex of vector spaces with an action of the differential that squares to zero. The reason the differential squares to zero here is that you have a consistent brain. Anyway, the space of ground states and the link homology is the cohomology of this complex. Um, in fact, for construction, uh, the vector space you get as a K term in a complex is spanned by intersection points of um, the, uh, the cup brains and the cup brains of equivariant degree J uh, and uh, for fixed Fermi number K at the K term. Um, so, uh, so in fact, this gives us a description of the floor complex together with the differential on it. So the differential constructed classically from glue and brains um, solves all the instant and counting problems at once. And this is how this um, equivalent solves the not categorification problem. So we've understood what carbon homology is. It's a small piece of this complex that describes the brain. It now has a geometric meaning. Which piece do you need? Um, you know, I don't want to go. Okay, let's not, let me not go to describing the algebra. It must be tired. Uh, the one that's determined by which you know which how do you close off the other end of the brain uh, of the of the knot? So that's that. And again, this works. This um, uh, the this I described it here for covenant homology. The exact same algebraic prescription works for any G. Um, uh, the caps are always the simples, and you always get the same kind of complex, and that's that. That's the meaning of not homology. Oh, thank you. So, thank you, Mina, for this very nice talk. Um, are there any questions? I think we have time for about a couple of questions. So, um, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions. Okay, then maybe ask, uh, let me, yeah, first of all, Mina, yeah, uh, thank you for a very impressive talk and also the paper. Yeah, so one, one question is that, uh, so you have a nice description of the Kobana homology in the second part of your uh, of the yeah. talk. And so if you reduce to the Jones polynomial, okay, is it a new known construction or let's see? As I said, yes, for the Jones polynomial is a known construction by Bigelow. Ah, uh, I see, I see, I see. It's, I see. It was, um, yeah, it was uh, it was discovered in the nineties, uh -huh, uh -huh. but um, right. I, I see. Okay. In all the it, 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 for all the others, it's not known. Even though, um, uh, okay. The bigger case is about the A, A type, or I think you, your construction works for any B algebra, right? So yeah, any, any any. So what I described so far is any simply Lazy algebra. Um, there is a there is a way to modify with minuscule representations at the moment. Mm -hmm. It's possible that in some cases you can um, you can mod you can um, allow non minuscule representations as well. But I do not know if the whole thing will go through. I see. I see. Uh, I, it, I, it's probably uh, it's probably true that 
It may not be as simple as this. For minuscule representations, it's very simple. I see. Yeah, you know, another question is that in the first part of your talk, uh, I think uh, you, you, there was a connection to QKZ, and basically, the I mean, consistency of QKZ uh, ensures the uh, the fact that uh, not invariant is well defined. It's an invariant of the knot, I guess. But uh, no, so QKZ would give you the integral of lattice knots. Okay. Uh, um, to quite literally, right? Uh, basically, <laughs> so. Uh, the way the story worked way back when is Knizhik and Logical wrote down the equation. Mm -hmm. uh, people like Tsuchiya and, and Kanye uh, uh, studied the monogamy and they discovered for SL2 that it can describe, they can describe it in terms of quantum groups. And then, you know, Drinfeld and Kazan and Luzdek came in and there and, you know, grew the whole story of quantum groups and their representation theory and so forth, right? Now, what um, what uh, was um, Frankel, Igor Frankel, and Rishitikin did is they noticed uh, that this whole structure deforms to the QKZ equation. Uh, they they proved that monodromy of their equation um, can also be formulated in terms of R matrices. So, if you are able to find those R matrices, if you can solve the monodromy problem the way Drinfeld solved the monodromy problem for the KZ equation. Um, Proving it's always formulated in terms of quantum groups, uh, so the, the, and so it's manifest that you get integral of lattice models. Sorry, my, then, then my question is that uh, okay, so the, the monodromy data does it satisfy this? Uh, I mean, usual Moore Zeibel relation. I mean, it's the deformation of CFD, so it, it, it should break some some axioms of Moore Zeibel. So I'm not saying that uh, no, no, no. So here you you just get that for the lattice models, you just get the R matrix. I don't know that that the I, fusion I, makes sense. I, I, I don't know that it does. That's an interesting question about the fusion will make sense, but it's not obvious to me that questions about caps and the cups make sense there. Ah, I see, I see. Okay, I see, I see. Uh -huh. So that, that's a so far a separate story. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I see, thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Um, so I've got one. Um, is does the proof for, um, uh, does the construction also work analogously for the case of um, non simply laced? Algebras, ah, non simple list Lie algebras is interesting. Um, the, um, the, 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 I, I, street theory predicts that there are two different ways to go about it. Okay. The one that's, I think, easiest is uh, where, um, where, uh, what, what we'll do is uh, we will uh, introduce um, uh, what. So it translates in the three-dimensional language, it translates to adding a twist um, around the, um, uh, well, in all cases, non-simple non stories, adding, um, adding a, a twist around a cigar. So what it translates into uh, is um, when you compute a trace, you, you, um, you, start with a, you start with a simple lace theory, and when you compute a trace, so the, the description which I think is simpler, Will be simpler when you compute the trace. You introduce an involution that uh, um, that rotates the, the nodes, and um, this involution is very very important because if, for example, if you just work with a you know the affine Grassmannian has unlike the, the Coulomb branch, <laughs> the affine Grassmann the, the slices in affine Grassmannian or monopole moduli spaces they have an obvious generalization to any simple lace Lie algebra, non simple lace Lie algebra, right? If you follow the path on the nodes you see immediately that, um, well, with a little bit of work, that you'll get the wrong roller characteristic. Naive, I find this mind does not work. Um, uh, what does work is this folding. You work with a simple lace theory and you introduce a twist that, that, that rotates the nodes, okay? Now, uh, the, um, I mean, to, to develop that at the level of, um, the first paper uh, I've already done. To develop it further to level second paper now, I have not, 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 I haven't gotten that far yet. But what one can show, for example, is also actually non-trivial that you get an unmorphology un correctly. Right? Because what, sorry? Only, just the un if you have pro products of unknowns, uh -huh. that you actually get the correct homology. Like that the oil characteristic is correct. Right? Mm -hmm. It didn't have to be true. Um, yeah, no, I think, uh, right, uh, all the story of the first paper will, will go through because uh, all you need is to maintain this equivariance under this twist. 
Mm -hmm. um, but whether the theory is actually fully solvable, maybe. It might be. I, it's, it's too far. Okay. I, I haven't actually um, explicitly written down the algebra um, even for other LGs, even though by the methods in the paper that it's, it's computable. So yeah, I mean, what this says, right, is that the theory is like, you know, if you like quivers, right, like the quivers we get for D-brains on the, on, you know, C3 mod Z3, you get a quiver for every collection of braids. And that quiver and its representations describe all the possible ways of closing off that selection of braids. So it's, it's kind of um, uh, like, to me, it's like, you know, this mirror symmetry book that Corey and the second one, it, mm -hmm. it, 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 if you're interested in mirror symmetry, for example, this gives tons of beautiful examples where actually everything is really, you know, um, they, because they come from representation theory. You actually do want to know the homes between the brains. And the fact that, you know, quivers will always are favorite models of derived categories of anything, right? Okay, if somebody, <laughs> whenever you go to any lecture about any community, Quickly, people move over to you know modular quiver representations. And that was, that's where that's where we stay. So these are like that, right? The fact that they are like that is why this theory is actually solved, which is striking, right? I mean, um, um, yeah. Thank you. It's it, yeah. So, and it's a you know it's a prediction of mirror symmetry, which mm -hmm. uh, wants to study. For example, it you know it predicts it's. It predicts, say, that you know the tilting line. I, I think it predicts that a tilting line bundle on these slices in a fine Grassmannian splits, mm -hmm. which is which means that you just have like an old, you know, right? Uh, yeah. So okay. everything is as an example that that Bondal dreamed up. Because those are already all over the place. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think uh, probably we don't have time for more questions. I mean, will you be here for other days of the workshop or? Um, I'll, I'll pop in at the other days of the workshop, but not okay. tonight. <laughs> right, okay. I think my parents already arrived actually. Okay, no worries. Okay, so All right. if there are any more questions, we can always um, talk to Mina later. So let's thank yes, you for great. this excellent talk. So thank you very much, Mina. Thank you so thank much. You much. Thanks for having me. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, so we can take a break for a few minutes and uh, reconvene for the next talk, which I believe is Jeff Harvey. So we're still waiting for Jeff to show up. Or is Jeff already here? Okay, no. Okay, then let's break for about five minutes and uh, meet back in five minutes. The Zoom room is going to be open. Yeah, I think you should stop.